Welcome to the TaxCast, 15 minutes of eye-opening global news and analysis on tax havens and corruption services from the Tax Justice Network, with me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone for download and broadcast on www.tackletaxhavens.com. First, the TaxCast news headlines. This month, yet more banking scandals. Another British bank, Standard Chartered, was accused by US regulators in New York of hiding hundreds of billions of dollars of Iranian transactions. They eventually admitted breaching US banking laws, but only to the tune of $14 million. They paid a $340 million settlement. Tax haven expert and financial crime writer, Jeffrey Robinson. That's not the end of it, because New York State is simply one of many players who are interested in this bank. I think that if the feds come in with civil and criminal charges and the city of New York, the DA, comes in with criminal charges, I suspect the bank will be dead within a year. They can't survive more fines and criminal charges. U.S. authorities are also investigating the Royal Bank of Scotland for possible Iranian sanctions violations. A new report has accused multinational corporations of illicitly transferring much of the estimated $1.5 trillion they make in Africa each year back to developed countries. The report from a panel convened by the African Union and the Economic Commission for Africa says if African countries had been able to stop or recover even a third of these losses, they could have paid off the external debt of the whole continent. As well as shifting profits out of Africa and depriving them of tax revenue, corporations are also successfully lobbying for additional tax incentives. Alvin Mosioma of Tax Justice Network Africa. There is a huge competition existing aimed at attracting investment. You find that uh, Kenya is offering a 10-year tax holiday where companies are operating for 10 years without paying a, a single penny to the, to the fiscals. The huge tax incentives that are being offered to attract foreign debt investment are not effective. Majority of companies put more emphasis on issues around infrastructure, around access to power, the legal framework that exists, and uh, human resource. Some crisis-hit European countries are experiencing outflows of physical cash and capital transfers at levels they haven't seen since the 1930s and 40s. It's a problem usually more common in developing countries, but in the first half of 2012, an estimated 163 billion euros left Spain and 270 billion euros left Italy so far this year. Specially trained dogs have sniffed out about 41 million euros in cash being smuggled out of Italy's borders as the Italian government cracks down on tax evasion to try and address its financial difficulties. The tax haven of Switzerland is likely to be one of the beneficiaries. Swiss banks are reporting high demand for safety deposit boxes, even running out of space to put them. And those are the tax cast headlines. Now we're going to talk to Richard Murphy for his take on tax justice events this month. OK, Richard, there's been an interesting development this month from the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. Tell us about it. The OECD has traditionally been completely wedded to the idea that tax information exchange should be on what is called a request basis. That is, the country that wants to know has to ask the country that they think has the information for the data they want about one of their taxpayers. Now, we've long argued that doesn't work well. Because you have to know so much information to make the request that very few information requests have ever taken place. We've argued for automatic information exchange. That means that the country which has the information on a taxpayer has to send it to the country where that taxpayer lives, if they live elsewhere. The OECD is now beginning to make very clear signs that it's going to endorse automatic information exchange. They're basically saying in the future, tax havens and other countries are going to have to cooperate with each other to make sure that every person pays the right amount of tax wherever they hide their money away from the country where they live. If the OECD is going to endorse this, we will see tax evasion around the world tumble. Well, it's good to have some good news, isn't it? Let's move on to the standard chartered banking scandal. Another day, another bank. Um, Why are so many British banks and non-US banks being caught out by the US regulators? US banks realised that when their regulators began to say that they expected compliance with regard to Iran and Iraq and so on, then they had to take note and take action. I'm afraid to say British banks trading in New York in dollars simply did not have the same attitude. 
They had the typical light touch regulation approach of London, thought that, frankly, blind eyes would be turned, and had a culture of regulatory abuse. I mean, there is a suggestion that Standard Chartered and other banks, it has to be said, stripped data from their wire transmission systems to make sure that it wasn't clear that these transactions involved Iran. The suggestion is that this is somehow American regulators picking on British banks. I don't think that's true. These banks had a tax haven culture, and it's being found out, and they're paying a penalty for it. I don't believe that US banks had quite the same tax haven culture, and as a result are surviving better. And we should point out, shouldn't we, that the US, while they are being very proactive in obtaining US citizens' cash hidden away in tax havens around the world, they are also quite happy to let non-residents and foreigners hide their money in New York banks, for example. There is no doubt that the US remains a quite effective tax haven for non-US citizens. Let's move on and talk about Usain Bolt, the well-known athlete who just won the 100 metres recently in the London Olympics and the 200 metres. And the four times 100 metre relay, three gold medals, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic achievements, um, not so fantastic attitudes towards tax. What he said is he won't come back to the UK because he will basically have to pay tax here as a result. Now that's of course true, he will. The UK government demands that tax be paid on the actual fee for appearing at a UK sports event if a person comes from outside the UK. That's a basic rate, it's only 20%. And they also have a rule that says that the number of appearances a year dictates what part of their earnings from non-sporting activity should also be taxed here. So if Usain Bolt only ran 10 times a year competitively, and one of those was in the UK, they say 10% of his worldwide income should be taxed here in the UK. That tax that he pays in the UK could be immediately offset against the tax that he pays wherever he is really tax resident in the world, whether that be Jamaica or the USA, and I'm not sure which that is. If he's still objecting, it must be because that income is in fact taxed at a lower rate somewhere else in the world than it is in the UK, and he just doesn't want to pay the tax at all. One of the great issues about the Olympics is it's about participation and encouraging participation, and he's saying he won't pay tax in the UK to give kids here the opportunity to take part in sport in the way he has. And as a result of this story, the BBC and other media outlets had a partner from Deloitte commenting on the story, claiming that Usain Bolt was due to appear at an athletics event for a £100,000 fee, but his tax liability would exceed his appearance fee. Now, I mean, the last time I checked, the UK didn't have 100% taxation. And... um, It does raise an important question, doesn't it, about the practice of the media using supposedly impartial commentators from large accountancy firms like Deloitte. Well, Deloitte are obviously in the business of helping people not pay tax. And part of their business activity is to lobby government to reduce tax paid by their clients. They don't disclose any of that when they go on the radio. They try to sound as though they are the impartial advisors who are simply commenting that there appears to be a 100% tax rate. Well, of course, there isn't a 100% tax rate. That's not true at all. And it was fairly clearly misrepresented. It was easy for people to misunderstand why this tax charge arose as a result of what they said. Let's go back to our other story about Standard Chartered. There were two people who were criticised by New York about the whole of the Standard Chartered affair. The second one was Deloitte for not providing an objective commentary to the regulator on what was really going on. I think the BBC should notice that and think twice before they use them as unbiased commentators on a tax event in the future. Thanks, Richard. Richard Murphy of Tax Research UK and author of The Courageous State. Now for this month's TaxCast special feature. According to the latest research by the Tax Justice Network, there's between $21 and $32 trillion hidden in the world's tax havens. And less than 100,000 people worldwide own almost 10 trillion of it. This month, the TaxCast looks at tax and inequality. If you thought indebted developing countries were poor, think again. This is Jim Henry, author of the Tax Justice Network report The Price of Offshore Revisited on the radio programme Democracy Now!
Developing countries account for about a third, we estimate, of the 21 to 32 trillion of financial assets that's offshore. For example, Nigeria is a supposedly a debtor country, but when you look at all the unrecorded capital outflows that have flowed out of Nigeria, it turns out that Nigeria is actually, like many other developing countries, a net creditor of the richest countries in the world. So that if you add up all the unrecorded capital flows that have accrued to the Nigerian elite, political as well as private sector, the tiny share of that country's population owns a vast amount of offshore wealth. So the debt problem is not really a debt problem. It's a tax problem. And he says it's banks like UBS, Credit Suisse, HSBC, JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs who specialise in helping individuals, corporations, dictators and criminals alike to stash their money in tax havens so they can avoid paying tax in the countries where it's due. Jim Henry again. If you are a wealthy Mexican investor, you can hold your bank deposits in New York City and uh, Citibank or UBS tax-free. The U.S. government doesn't collect taxes on bank deposits by non-resident aliens, and it doesn't tell the Mexican authorities that you're earning all that money. So basically, we have designed our tax laws, the United States, the U.K., Switzerland, to become the largest tax havens in the world. The actual offshore islands, like the Caymans, are just conduits to these ultimate destinations. And what this does to developing countries in particular, because they can't tax income, because they can't tax wealth, they end up taxing low- and middle-income people with VAT taxes and sales taxes that are regressive. Globalization is driving a big hole through the nation-state system that was designed to raise tax revenue. And it's not just the world's poorer countries or the poorest citizens in those countries who suffer. Writers of the groundbreaking book The Spirit Level, Kate Pickett and Richard Wilkinson, are experts in inequality. They researched wealthy market economies around the world. The data they collected consistently shows people's quality of life is affected most, not by the size or wealth of their nation, but by its levels of equality. Kate Pickett explains. The measure we've used in our book is the difference between the incomes of the top 20% of the population and the bottom 20%. And in the most unequal countries we look at, like the UK and the USA and Portugal, the rich have incomes that are about seven to nine times those in the bottom fifth. Whereas in those more equal countries, the Scandinavian countries and Japan, the rich have incomes that are three and a half to four times those of the poorest fifth. Richard Wilkinson. So often inequality is considered as just an ethical or moral issue to do with fairness and so on, whereas we're showing empirical data that more unequal societies have ten times the homicide rates. The proportion of population in prison tends to be as much as ten times as high in more unequal societies teenage pregnancy or mental illness and infant mortality are two or three times as high. It's not just one or two things that are affected by the scale of inequality, it's almost everything. And a progressive tax system can enhance the redistribution and push towards greater equality. In the UK and the USA, for example, we used to have much higher top tax rates, we used to have much greater equality, we used to do better on some of the health and social outcomes that we're looking at. And higher crime levels, obesity, poorer physical and mental health are all very costly to the state. But their evidence shows inequality is also bad for business. Inequality has been a really important contributor to the um, financial crash of 1929. And so all the systems which have allowed inequality to increase have contributed to the present economic crises. There is no evidence that more unequal societies have faster economic growth, rather the reverse. We've been growing much more slowly since income differences widened from the later 1970s onwards. That's true of most of the countries where we saw that widening take place. Inequality is a cause of economic crises and a constraint on economic growth and productivity. When we have businesses where those running them think their only duty of care is to their external shareholders, less to society and less to their own employees, then that's a very sort of particular view of what business is for, and it's not the only possible view. So that it is possible to have a more ethical capitalism. It doesn't have to be the way we've been told 
it must be for the past couple of decades. I mean, that is a particular ideology that just no longer seems to hold up, either in economic or in moral terms. Kate and Richard talk of a cultural shift to a democratised economy with progressive taxation, employee-owned, mutual and cooperative-run businesses. The evidence suggests companies that have employee share ownership schemes and have participative management bring fairly reliable increases in productivity. FTSE 100 companies, fairly typically you get pay differentials of 300 to 1 between the CEO and the least well-paid employee. But in many of the cooperatives it's much, much smaller than that. The current dominant model of capitalism has tended to increase the income inequality gap. It's also expanded freedoms to the financial sector to help corporations and the wealthy hide their money offshore and deprive nations of tax revenue, despite the fact that private sector success depends on public investment and support. But tax havens can be closed down, and business can be a healthy part of society, not cut off from it. You've been listening to The Taxcast. We'll bring you more news and analysis next month. Thank you.